So could you be nice this one? Yeah, come on. Uh, I'll be using. I'll see about using both. Okay, hi guys. So oh, thank you. This is, I have one view. I have one viewer. Okay, starting shortly is a uh, life before death. That's the uh, Jubilee Death campaign. And I will be live streaming as much as I can. No one wanted it. I tried to sell it, you know, auction. What happened? It might have actually connected, but now I You have someone from Goldsmith logging in here. Are you wrong in this one? Already? Yeah, but no, I can't. Oh, just cancelled. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, no, that's cool. Ah, because I'm using it. <laughs> are you, uh, where are you going to be? Mostly in G50, but I'm going to be here for this session. Mostly in G50. Yeah. I need to make sure I'm speaking. Uh, okay. I tried to, to actually get some people, but then they're all interested. Something's happening in Brighton and all that sort of thing. Oh, thank you, Connie. Okay, so we have Global Occupied International Day already. Excellent. No, we have uh, Global Rev Live, Global ONN, and uh, all the other. They take my take the um, the live stream and send it to them, which is great, which we need. And unfortunately, I uh, lost my. Um, the connection again. It's damn annoying. I keep, I keep losing the damn thing. <laughs> um, I Each time I have to actually buy it, 10 quid. <laughs> Should I just um, write you down my login on a piece of paper? Yes. Here. Um. So I guess we'll be starting soon. I was going to start it, but I forget it.
and where our failures as a global society mean that life today means death for years for many. And they show that despite the fact that while well, the Jubilee campaign has had amazing success over the years, getting over $130 billion of debt cancelled, our mission of freeing people across the world from the chains of debt remains unfulfilled. That's why we continue to call for the ancient and enduring concept of Jubilee, the cancel of unpayable debt, the universal concept, one that exists in Muslim, Jewish and Christian traditions, and is one that is relevant to developed and developing countries alike. It's incredible and terrifying to see the same structural adjustment policy that helped create the debt crisis in many developing countries over 20 years ago and now being imposed upon countries in the Eurozone. It's incredible and terrifying that we are still coming out of the financial crisis, a crisis that at its heart was subprime loans, essentially unpayable debt, and the consequences of which uh, with millions in countries both developed and developing, losing jobs and homes. We still now see individuals all over the world being sucked into ever increasing debt and trying to compensate for inequality, reduce wages, and increase cost of living. <coughs> this is why this conference is needed. This is why the Jubilee Debt Campaign continues to fight for their doing. And it's why, if we leave here today as inspired to realize the concept of Jubilee, to change the systems that are trapping individuals and countries in debt, and not stop until we reach our goal, then we too can both be incredible and terrifying. Incredible for what we can achieve and terrifying for those who seek to stand in our way and try to maintain an unjust system of debt. So let's take that challenge, be inspired today, and help millions around the world to live a life free from the chains of debt. So that's my introduction, and it's now my great privilege to introduce the director of the Jubilee Debt Campaign, Sarah Jane Fester. Thanks very much, and enjoy the day. And we want to ask if um, this morality is just, and also 
think it's relevant to us. Um, to the challenges that we face as humanity in the 21st century, or if we need to relive it um, and, and find something else. And to, um, to do this, we've got a fantastic and really esteemed panel. Um, uh, our first speaker is Lee Fayetal Instruction. Um, Roman has served as the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury, the principal leader of the Church of England. He's an ardent advocate for social justice. Um, and he's now a uh, master of Modern College Cambridge and also the Chancellor of the University of South Wales. Um, and we're also incredibly lucky to be joined by um, lots of international speakers here today, but particularly now um, two fantastic international um, <coughs> campaigners and activists. Um, and there's Steve Dagan, who is, um, who is and was and still is um, a really key <coughs> campaigner in the movement in the global south who challenged and just and illegitimate um, relevant country debt. Um, and he's also um, founded and executive director of the Daughters of Mundi in Kenya, um, which is my own base, and it's an organisation which um, works on grassroots campaigning around uh, food sovereignty and gender rights. And also, um, finally, we've got Andrew Ross, who's Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University. Um, and he's also an activist with the really exciting US Rights Debt Movement and the Rolling We Believe Project, Rolling We Believe in the US. And he's also the author of many books which are really relevant to this discussion, um, including the recently published project Pentocracy and the uh, Case to Debt People. Um, just in terms of format, there's, um, because we haven't got much time, we're just going to keep it to the panel for this session, but then. Um, and JC and Andrew are going to be around our discussions throughout the day, so hopefully there will be lots of time for you to kind of ask questions and have more discussions. Um, so, um, Andrew, I can start with you, is that okay? Um, it's a uh, first question. Um, what do you think um, this, if you kind of expand it more about this contemporary morality of debt, what do you think it consists of? Um, and where it's kind of, um, what central messages are and where it's particularly in power? Um, I want to thank you, first of all, and also to Jonathan for organizing this, and to everyone for coming out early in the morning. It's such a lovely day. Um, I, when, when I saw the title for the, uh, the session, it gave me pause because uh, <coughs> I never thought of myself as a moralist. In fact, I, I, I don't like to think of myself as a moralist. Um, but since I've gotten involved in, uh, in debt resistance work, <laughs> come to realize very quickly that uh, morality is the primary battleground upon which creditors and debtors tend to clash. And it's almost unavoidable. Um, why is that? It's because it's the, it's the front line of consent for the financial industry. Uh, the financial industry depends on payback morality in order to pursue its claims. And, uh, and I describe it as a, a front line of consent, <coughs> of consent, because behind the consent, when the consent fails, there are, of course, uh, the mechanisms of coercion and, uh, and, and violence, as you mentioned earlier on in the introduction. And those include, of course, the police, the courts, the debtors' prisons, the Paris Club, the London Club, the international bond market, and so on and so forth, the Troika. Uh, many mechanisms of coercion, but uh, bankers would rather would rather operate <laughs> uh, in the realm of consent in, in enforcing our debt obligations. Now, uh, having said that, bankers did not invent uh, payback morality. It's something that's very deeply ingrained in our mentality, almost every society, and uh, we have been we've been encouraged to believe that. Um, Civilization will crumble if, uh, if people do not honor their obligations to repay that. We're encouraged to believe that the souls of individuals, even Anglicans, uh, will be, uh, will be tar tarnished and perhaps <coughs> imperiled as a result. And uh, there are many people who believe that uh, there's an inherent virtue in paying back that, and it's the very definition of justice. It's the very foundation of moral philosophy. But actually, if you look at the case history a little more closely, things get a little complicated. 
for example, speaking of moral philosophy, early on in Plato's Republic, Socrates rebuts the argument that uh, the definition of justice lies in. He's saying that he cites, uh, cites a case in which he considered it would not be virtuous to return a borrowed weapon to its owner if in the interim you, um, uh, you were informed that the owner had gone insane. Um, in some cases, in other words, it's more virtuous to refuse to return. It's more virtuous to refuse to pay back your debt. So how do we think about Socrates' lessons? How do we apply it to the current debt crisis? Uh, one of the ways of doing that is to, is to revert the instrument of moralism or morality or payback morality that the finance industry imposes on us. Turn around uh, these instruments and subject the creditors themselves to very heavy moral scrutiny. How do they stand up to that very heavy moral scrutiny? Not very well. Um, if you've been, uh, you know, a lot of you have, you've been reading the headlines week after week for the last five years, it's been a long pattern of uh, malfeasance, fraudulence, deceit, extortion on the part of banks. The list is very long and grisly. Uh, subprime lending, uh, pursuit of illegal foreclosures, uh, pseudo forgiveness of phantom debt, bankers' collusion and LIBOR rate fixing, um, the payment to such an insurance ripoff, uh, the continued mendacity of the collection agents. I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on and on. This is that, that kind of moral conduct, very antisocial conduct. Uh, is, is pretty reprehensible, and there's no uh, there's no sign that uh, the finance industry is going to reform that conduct very soon. The likelihood is that they will continue to perform in that manner. So perhaps it's perfectly justified in comparing uh, bankers to Socrates' uh, deranged creditor. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it's perfectly justified in saying that. Uh, repaying our debts, those that we consider illegitimate, and I know there's a distinction between legitimate and illegitimate debts that we can talk about, but perhaps we should compare that to the borrowed weapon, returning that borrowed weapon uh, that Socrates speaks based on. Perhaps it would be more virtuous, it would be the right thing to do, it would be the moral thing to do to refuse to pay our debts. If, uh, for example, uh, creditors make loans in the full knowledge that those loans will not be repaid. Who is the delinquent agent in that relationship? The debtor is usually designated as delinquent if that debtor cannot pay back. But surely the creditor is a morally delinquent agent. If a creditor uh, lays a debt trap for you, as they're doing all the time, by extending fresh credit simply so that we can perform existing debt service, if they knowingly lay that debt trap, who is the delinquent agent in that equation? If a creditor makes loans knowing full well that the only actor that will benefit from those loans is the creditor, and that the, these loans will generate social and environmental harm, who is the delinquent agent in that equation? These are the kinds of questions I think you begin to ask and get answers for if you turn around the instruments of morality and train them, the heavy artillery, a soft artillery rather, but the heavy ar artillery of the courts, uh, if you turn them upon the creditor themselves. Just one last thing I'd say is that um, most of the moral debate about, um, um, about debt repayment has revolved around sovereign debt, and with very good reason, because we're seeing failed democracies all across the world right now. <coughs> Elected officials are being uh, forced to prioritize the rights of creditors to be made whole over and above the responsibility to take care of the social needs of the citizenry. And in fact, they're being asked to use government as debt collection agents. And, uh, and the result are, are, are failed democracies. Um, we have, uh, we've seen in the historical records that societies that cannot check the power of the creditor class 
but they very quickly see the onset of debt bondage and debt slavery. And the big question it really is, are we are we headed along the same pathway? Are we at that kind of crossroads? Are we on the road to debt serfdom? And or is it just rhetoric? Because a lot of the talk that's going on uh, right now for the last decade and a half has, has been um, has been full of these terms and concepts that are, have a very ancient uh, resonance, like the debt jubilee, uh, like debt payment, like debt bondage, like indenture, extreme <coughs> forms of usury. And in the U.S., we've seen uh, the revival of debtors' prisons in, uh, in almost as many as 20 states now were abolished in the 1840s. Each of these terms and concepts has a very heavy moral resonance that dates back centuries, really, to antiquity. Um, but is it just rhetoric, or are we really facing this, this uh, uh, very, very serious crisis, not just of democracy, but an existential crisis? Because many of these deaths we're talking about, and, and, and here, a lot of my own work has been on household debt and personal debt for the most part. I think of these as existential debt uh, because uh, they, they're incurred because uh, the creditor class has, uh, has made it absolutely uh, impossible to survive without access to vital social goods that are personally debt financed. Mm -hmm. Things like education and health care are existential debt. You can't really separate your body from them. Your health and your learning and your knowledge are inalienable assets. Like they're not like houses or automobiles or flat things you need where you can separate the asset out and you sell it in some secondary asset market. Education and health are inalienable. So this is, a, this is an existential crisis as well as being a crisis of, uh, of democracy at the level of sovereign debt. Thanks, Henry. Um, so, and thank you. Um, rejection of the, um, the dominant morality um, that conceptual being a pagan um, was quite central to the movement in the 1980s and 1990s with the um, council of the Virgin Country Death in the Global South. Um, a lot of people in the um, were part of that movement, part of that, but I think quite a few people um, weren't in a new to that campaign. Um, could, you, um, could you share a, a bit about the, well, so called about the movement and, and its history? I think you said to me um, about uh, the protest by which um, campaigners in the Great South rejected that dominant morality and, and how that was important to the sentiment. Um, thank you. I also want to um, express my thanks for the invitation to be here and um, to the audience for showing up. I, mean, I have to say I'm quite impressed um, by the panel, but I also think that um, the reality as it is for many people around the world makes it necessary for all of us to begin to or to continue pay attention to the question of death. Um, I think that um, in some quarters, uh, people believe that death is done um, because uh, from their perspective, death was a problem of the global south. And now that in Europe, in, in, um, in countries that before were only on one side of the equation, this is um, becoming a reality, um, it is again being revived. So I do want to thank you and I um, um, and, and say that what is happening in Europe, what is happening in the UK um, comes on the heels of a crisis that in the global south um, for decades has been eating away at people's lives and, uh, and people's dignity as it were. Um, I want to start with a story. I, I, um, I used to live and work in Washington, D.C., in the valley of the East, we called it, and uh, worked for the 50 Years of Enough Network. It was a campaign that had been founded in 1994, um, around the 50th anniversary of the World Bank and the IMF. 
and um, in a way, it was a very uh, crappy campaign, but very uh, effective. We were fighting and we were campaigning against these monster institutions, and they came about to pay attention to us and to listen to what we were saying, at least um, from a, a public relations perspective. But we engaged with them for on many, many fora in many different kinds of ways. And um, with the Jubilee campaign, which of course has this uh, Judeo-Christian uh, basis and the, and the concept, um, there was inside the World Bank uh, headquarters in Washington, there was a group, it was called the Friday Morning Group, and these were people of faith who worked at the World Bank and had this breakfast um, every Friday, and they would have speakers and different kinds of of people that they would invite. In my almost 10 years, I was invited there once. Um, and I took along a friend. When I, I'm from Kenya, and when I started working in Washington, somebody said to me, never go into a meeting by yourself. <laughs> you must always come with somebody else to, um, to back you up, to be your witness, to, uh, to help you, uh, and to uh, keep you company and sometimes to give you courage. So I asked a colleague uh, who was the chairperson of the religious working group on the World Bank and there I met. These were the faith-based organizations that were part of the uh, 50 years of the last campaign. So we went um, to the Friday morning group. They met at breakfast and it was, um, I don't know, maybe the word is ridiculous to describe kind of the spread that uh, was laid out before us and given the topic. I, I, I don't know what they discussed on another Friday morning, but that day was about third world death and um, I was embarrassed by sort of the bounty that was put in front of us and I, I think I only just had some juice, but um, we had a very interesting conversation and um, I don't remember very much about it, but I remember an exchange that my, my friend and colleague Marie had with one of the, um, of the people from the World Bank, and it was, um, the, the group was former World Bank employees and current World Bank employees, and so some people even who had moved out from being staff and were now consulting at the World Bank because they sort of had this revolving door thing happening. So there was an exchange with a guy who identified himself as a former staff member who was now a consultant. And he went on to say, as we talked about the problem with the loans and uh, the projects that the World Bank was, had been doing in many countries, he went on to say that he worked on many projects and there were good projects and they, there were problems that had developed and of course you know, it wasn't his fault or the World Bank it was the fault of the government and the country and the people, wherever the projects were. I don't actually remember the details. And he can swear up and down that each and every um, contract and each and every uh, loan was legal. And so uh, we, we had had a wide ranging conversation that included discussions of corruption, but of course, corruption was only on one side, not on the side of the World Bank or any people. <laughs> who were employed by the World Bank, but they left, they practically left nothing but corrupt people on the other side. So he went on and on, and um, uh, my friend Marie is, I used to use all the joke actually that we wanted to be her when we grew up. She's very um, calm and very smart, and she's one of those people who can, you know, if I get, upset, I'll shout and jump up and down, Marie gets very quiet. And so this guy is going on and on and saying how everything was legal and because we had been having a conversation saying that since the institution we were told over and over could not be held accountable, that perhaps it was time that the employees of the institution were held accountable and uh, so the guy said, well, I, everything I did, uh, every, um, document was in order and everything was legal. And Marie turns to him and says, well, it was legal, but was it moral and was it just? And you could have 
have heard a pin drop in this room. Um, and the question was never answered, just to be clear. But I think that um, the, the, the idea that the system of debt, especially in the globe that affects the global south, that's what I've worked on for a long time, and that's probably why I'm here, that it, that it has any morality is beyond my comprehension, because the things that, um, the problems that it creates for countries, for communities, for individuals, is beyond the beyond anything that uh, we would consider reasonable. In the Jubilee South campaign, one of the things that um, the campaign was really successful in was telling that story, telling the story mm -hmm. of what it means to the first state decision, to the health, to the environment, or to the rights of women, <laughs> to the rights of communities, to the rights of the country. What the best meant in that sense. But um, the Jubilee South campaign also did something which was to question even the language, whereby uh, it was about creditors and debtors. It was um, about owing and paying. It was about monetary considerations that did not take into account any number of other costs that um, were associated with the debt. So the, the Jubilee South campaign uh, partnered with the uh, <coughs> the jewelry campaigns in the North to say this is how you are looking at it, but this is how we see it, this is how we live it, this is how we experience it. And um, there's a lot of things that, is, that I can say about the Jubilee South campaign, but one of the questions that was constantly asked and continues to be asked is about who owes who. Um, if you're just talking about the monetary debt, then perhaps the balance sheet would show one thing. But if you talk about the historical debt, the ecological debt, um, the social debt, um, then it changes that dynamic and it changes how the, the debt is considered. The Jubilee campaign was founded, the, the, the Jubilee 2000 campaign as it was called, was founded um, in fact years after um, a number of countries and, and campaigns around the global south had been campaigning on the issue of debt in Mexico, in the Philippines, in places like Nigeria and Ghana. Um, they, the campaigning against debt had been going on, but around the 2000, uh, the Jubilee 2000 campaign, it was a time when a lot of people around the world took on this, um, this question of debt, and uh, many of them have continued to do that. And as I say, I'm actually thrilled to see a room full of people coming to talk about debt, because for some people, the chapter was sort of closed, and it's reopening again, and this consideration is really important. I want to end by saying this, that as long as debt is considered something about money and not about the impact and the effect that it has on people's lives, um, we will get very far. Because what you were saying about the morality and about people needing to pay what they owe in terms of money, then, you know, you, there are not very many people who will find any safe to fight that. You owe a hundred dollars, you owe a hundred pounds, you pay a hundred pounds. The question for Jubilee South, the question for all of us, in fact, and the question that I think people in the United Kingdom and people across Europe and other countries in the U.S. are beginning to ask, I pay back that hundred pounds of that hundred dollars at what cost? Because it's not just about the hundred dollars, the cost of the hundred dollars, it is the impact that it has on the quality of life, on the dignity, on the future, on the heritage, on the environment, on so many other things, at what cost? And as long as we're asking that question and we're asking it equally about people in the South, people in the North, 
rich people, poor people, working people, the aristocracy, whoever, if we ask that question at what cost, then it changes the dynamic and it raises questions, moral questions in that. And I think that's where the morality comes. The morality for me is not about that I own 10 pounds, must pay 10 pounds. The morality comes on this very issue of at what cost do I do that? Thank you, and thank you. Um, Ryan, speaking to you, there's, um, there's, there's the roots of um, much more justice oriented uh, um, morality around that in, in lots of different space positions. Um, uh, so much of them in his introduction, but he did he did um, and scriptures for for um uh find the need to, to see people from that slavery. Um and I think in turn to the, the gospel right of course uh Jesus is putting that to give message at the centre of his prayer for um a new world. Do you think um the moral and ethical teaching of the Bible has open up space for redefinition of this of this sort of morality that we Thank you. Let me echo the thanks of the other speakers, everyone, for coming today and for the organizers for putting this on. I think there certainly are resources of the kinds you mentioned in the tradition. And one of the things I think of that to me be most startling but still most challenging is something that was said by William Tyndale, the translator of the Bible into English in the 16th century who had a remarkably visionary, radical sense of what the reading of scripture might do for British society at that point. And one of the things he said is that we have to remember that whatever we have that is superfluous, we owe to those who haven't got enough. Whatever we have that is superfluous, we actually owe to those who don't have enough. And that does exactly the reversal that's been talked about, making us rethink debt in terms of basic human obligation. That's where I want to go back to um, the Hebrew scriptures and the concept of Jubilee that you mentioned. And uh, oh, to go it's been sort of dusted off and deepened in discussion in the last couple of decades in the way we've heard. And essentially, it's a system of amnesty. In cycles of seven years and cycles of seven times seven, 49 years, there is essentially a debt amnesty. And this is laid out in some detail in some of the books of Hebrew scripture, particularly in Leviticus. Um, and since you may not all instantly have this little thing in it, <laughs> pick out a couple of details from the discussion there, because I think there are at least four principles in the account of this in Leviticus. Four principles which are of real substantive value in thinking these issues through today. First of all, the assumption is poverty is not going to disappear overnight in any society. That is, there are always going to be people who need. So, the question is, what's your response going to be? You can, you can and you're encouraged to lend to the poor. But, first principle, you don't seek profit from another's mistress. You don't seek profit for another's mistress, from another's mistress. And that explains some of the other constraints that are put on the process of lending. Second principle is a very radical one indeed. The land, which is the source of economic wealth and security in that pre-modern society, the land doesn't belong to anybody. The land itself is on loan to you from God. It's not a possession. But for you are all already indebted in some sense and treat the possession of land and property of disposable wealth as if it were absolute possession. It's a misunderstand the whole nature of your humanity in a world where you are dependent on what you haven't made. It's a world in which you are dependent on what you haven't made. You're always, in fact, indebted to start with. And in Leviticus, God says very firmly, I go 
of the land. That is to say, you are all having the use of the land for a period. And when you are trading, what you think is property, what you're actually trading is you. Practice. The practice of wealth production. It's a habit. It's a human practice. It's not based on absolute ownership. Third principle is a fairly obvious one built into the cycle of land disputes, as I call it. There's always going to be a danger of what you might call a spiral of asymmetry. Sorry about the jargon. A spiral of asymmetry. That is, the gap between creditor and debtor widens and widens and widens. There is no particular reason why that should ever stop unless you decide to stop it. So, says the strategy of investors, you better decide to stop it. Otherwise, that gap will grow wider and wider. The wealth of those who think they possess spirals upwards, and the dependence and penury of those who get spirals downwards. So, you have to make some very clear intentional policies about how you limit that spiral. And the last of these four principles is an interesting one. It's a prohibition of unlimited collateral. Let me explain. You don't take as security against the debt something that somebody else needs for their survival. It's put very simply. You lend somebody money, they give you a pledge, token of promise that they will return it. If somebody offers you their cloak overnight as security against a loan, don't take it. They're going to need it in the cold night. And that very, very simple image, I think, sums up the principle. There is no unlimited collateral. You can't, in other words, manage your lending in such a way as to deprive the debtor of what is essential for their survival and their human dignity. There are four rather interesting principles, I think, and I, I don't think they're just relevant to the Bronze Age in the Middle East. The very fundamental one, ownership is never absolute. We are all dependent in advance on what we did not make and don't possess. We have to be very clear and intentional about confronting the risk of <laughs> unlimited Living a part of the rich and poor. Because, of course, the lender is always in a position of power and in a position to intensify the dependence of the debtor, which is the patterns of interest. We don't profit at all from the misery of another. And we don't, quite clearly, go out aggressively lending in order to maximize our own income. The basic premise of all this is that. Borrowing and lending are to do with the management of crisis. That is, when people need what they can't produce for themselves, and in general, society encourages others to supply it, not at total cost to themselves, but in an ordered, managed way. You don't, in other words, undertake lending in order to squeeze something out of the dependent to make them more dependent. And finally, we don't go into the business of lending with the habit, the assumption of taking away what is essential for the life of another. Now, I think all of those have a lot to say about how debt has evolved internationally and domestically in recent years. And I would say that pretty well all of those principles that I've enunciated have been ignored and sidelined again and again in every possible way. Both internationally and domestically, a great deal of the debt problem, as I think we all know, as you've heard eloquently this morning, has to do with aggressive lending. That is, with the passionate urge to push money around so that it doesn't sit around not turning anything. Somebody 
you've got to be borrowing. And if they're not, there's something wrong. You better go out and make them borrow. So the watershed period of the 1970s, when a lot of our current debt problems really began to get underway, had to do, of course, with the, the need to move around unexpectedly large revenue connected with the oil situation at that point and the aggressive lending pattern established itself as normative. But, of course, it's not so very different from short debt loan companies in our own society. And that's another story, but one which I feel rather strongly about. Last point, and that is to echo what's been said very clearly by my colleagues here, which is that it's no good talking about the morality of debt without talking about the nature of the creditor's responsibility. And I think that's what we've heard loud and clear from the platform this morning. What is the nature of the creditor's responsibility? What is ethical lending? What is ethical lending? We are so focused on the ethics of repaying debt because it seems obvious that we've ignored the fact that to lend is a decision, an intentional decision, <coughs> which therefore has moral questions that can rightly be asked around it. What is ethical lending? And a great deal of what has been has not been ethical lending, whether it's in terms of the international system since 1970, or more recently, of course, in terms of subprime mortgages. And then on that, because I feel that some, if I were in Kenya, Zambia or Colombia or wherever, I might take it rather hard to be lectured on the ethics of financial responsibility. My system within the last six years or so has produced what it's produced in Europe. <coughs> I might take it rather hard to be told that I needed to get an ethical approach to get the payments when they clearly have no notion of the ethics of lending. So what is the nature of the creditor's responsibility? I think that's the question which affects most of the situation of sovereign debt internationally and, of course, all those issues that produced the financial crisis of the last few years in our own society. And that had to do not only with the ethics of pushing debt at people, which is the aggressive lending I've been talking about, but also the blindness, which has been mentioned, the blindness on the part of some creditors to the social and moral effect of <coughs> on debt repayment at the cost, not only of education, health care, the cost of firing food prices, but also the cost of good governance and functioning democracy. Because that's another vicious circle that we get into here, which really does need to be addressed. So I think, yes, there are plenty of resources in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but also in others. I've simply focused on that because it's where I, I stand. Plenty of resources for looking at what might constitute a really ethical practice of resource exchange, let's call it that, resource exchange, in ways that would limit the risk of what I call the spiral of asymmetry and the consequent degradation of the borrower is the benefit of the creditor. Lots of people here at the moment, so um, I'll be staying at the Brunei um, lecture hall. So I'll uh, just check it out, Jubilee Debt Campaign. And if you can, please keep tweeting.
key question which we're trying to join quite a few of the sessions today. Um, so hopefully there'll be lots more discussion around that. Um, in the last 10, 15 minutes, I, I just wanted to focus on two um, particular questions which I think your, your contributions throw up, which have a particular bearing on what we're trying to do today. Um, the first one is obviously what are the implications of this for the main challenges around that that we're facing at the moment? So to, to draw that out a, a little bit more, um, and so you, you touched on the kind of victories of the, um, the, the digital movement in terms of um, developing country debt cancellation. Um, but many people will, will know that there are large um, numbers of, of um, Debt problems. Many countries in the global south who did make uh, make it into the HIPAA process, which was the, the process which was the kind of victory of the refugee movement, um, because at the time they weren't poor enough. Um, and those countries are many of them are facing significant problems with socially unmanageable debt, um, which are continuing to grow as, as they are having to borrow additional service debts. And we do a lot of solidarity work with. Campaigners in countries like Granada, Jamaica, Granada's been in default for um, a year. Um, and Philippines, so many of these countries um, facing um, up to kind of 20% of their government revenue every year, having to pay them debt repayment at the expense of healthcare and the protection of um, provision of basic services. Um, and even countries who, who made it into the HIPAA process um, are also now finding that they are. Um, uh, facing a manageable amount of, of sovereign debt. And then obviously we've got the enormous sovereign debt which um, countries in the um, Eurozone are facing also as a result of the bank bailouts and the financial crisis. Um, and also there's, um, and we've got questions today on this, we, we're also facing, if you could touch on, a, a personal debt crisis. Um, so just in this country um, there was some statistics from the government money advice service last year that said that 18% um, of the population now, that's about 9 million people, are really struggling with serious debt problems in this country. Um, we had two, two banks um, feeling about 60,000 people last year and the CEC says that we, this has been the longest period of um, real wage cuts since the Great Depression of the 1870s. Um, so there's some real, really kind of quite crunchy questions there about what does a, a more just morality around debt mean for these real challenges around sovereign debt and personal debt um, that we're facing today. Um, Iceland, for example, um, in its response to the financial crisis, um, they caused um, really significant state-led <coughs> write downs on personal debt on household mortgages to families who are really um, struggling with mortgage repayments. And rather than cutting public services in response to the crisis, they actually extended public services because they thought people would, would need more support in the context of an economic crisis. Obviously, we see the opposite of that with austerity across much of Europe um, and um, in the UK as well. So what does, what does this mean? Should we be looking more at um, state-led personal debt forgiveness cancellation, um, but also what we need in terms of the global movement to challenge all of these new sovereign debts which have been built up. Um, and and the, the second question which also has a real bearing I think for what we're talking about today is what are the limits to this concept of debt forgiveness? Um, obviously it's core to really challenging the injustices of debt that we're talking about um, and we need to really push forward with um, uh, really highlighting the cost of, of unjust debt and the responsibility of the creditors. But does the concept of debt forgiveness hide to some extent the real root causes of, um, of unjust and indiscriminate debt? Um, people not being able to earn enough to, um, to feed their families, so having to rely on debt <coughs> in order to, to cover basic needs. Um, countries in the global south continuing to have enormous quantities of wealth extracted through tax evasion, tax evasion through um, extraction of natural resources which primarily profit multinational companies in the global north, um, located on the London Stock Exchange, for example. So, so how 
also if you go beyond depth of being able to tackle these real root causes of um, the disability members of that. So um, let's just throw those back to you, if that's okay. <laughs> Can I I'd just put three things on the table there? Um, one is picking up the points you touched on, which is of particular interest to me as I'm currently chair of the Trustees of System A, and one of our main focal points recently has been a campaign about tax transparency, which is actually very closely related to the ethical questions that we've talked about here. The fact that there are companies who do not pay uh, adequate levels of tax in the country where they operate most fully, most profitably. That is, again, about the obligations that are not recognized and not dealt with. It's about what is owed without it being intentional. So I think tax, tax transparency is part of a general strategy on this that we want to see really carried out. Second point is exactly the point you were making about looking at root causes and therefore looking at what it is that creates and sustains dependence how do you get beyond that? How do you get to a situation where people are to some significant extent in control of the circumstances of their lives, able to provide food for keeping their families and sustaining their own, their own uh, well-being? And the third obvious one, which I think is pertinent here in this country and pertinent internationally, is the question, what are we actually proactively investing in? What are we investing? Are we investing in a future of security, the creation of a healthy economic public, economically healthy public, if that were? Are we actually pushing those out to create new forms of employment, national and international? Because the existence of debt payments is unrealistic form is entirely backward looking. And surely we have to say, well, what, what do we do with the point? Thank you. Um, when the Hippie Initiative was introduced, um, the World Bank decided to take part of it, to be part of the process, the IMF kind of opted out. Um, and when, when you looked at what the Hippie Initiative was offering, it was clear that um, what the debt campaigners were calling for <coughs> and what the World Bank or the, the lending institutions, including uh, the London Club and the Paris Club and the G8, what they heard was something very, very different. And, um, and I think this is one of the one of the challenges that we have as campaigners, that as we make demands and we put forward put forth um, positions, we are sometimes not very clear about what it is exactly that we need. So that there is sometimes an interpretation that is given that means we don't get what we want. So the first public initiative um, had certain requirements, including compliance with structural adjustment programs for six years. Um, we say, no, no, that's not what we meant. So in uh, the second, uh, the HIPAA 2 process, we actually used to refer to it as the HIPAA process. Um, the, we said, okay, maybe not six. Three, three years of, of compliance. And this was announced at the, uh, just to date myself a little bit, at the 1999 GA summit which was held in Cologne. And um, I remember uh, the response was that we say break the chains of debt, not polish the chains of debt, <laughs> which is what we felt going from six years of structural adjustment programs to three years meant that they were really not breaking the chains but polishing the chains of debt. And this was also, by the way, the response of the South African Council of Churches. Um, there are certain things, tax justice is one, 
there are a number of things that um, in the uh, developing campaigning that have come up uh, as ways in which we can begin to get a handle on the on the cycle and the structure of that. But I think that um, I want to highlight three different things. Uh, one of them has been a call for the litigation of debt, um, whereby countries just say enough and put a stop and that's it. You know, the world won't stop. I mean, and, and, and they fear that if a country defaults or a number of countries default, that this will be, mean the end of the the end of everything. It's not true. Iceland is a case um, that we can have, we can lift up in that. So the question of mitigation of debt, the question of reparations. I know this makes people very nervous, very uncomfortable, but I think it's something that we should seriously look at as campaigners. And I think it is a position and an argument that has been made by campaigners in the South, and I think that if it is echoed and embraced by campaigners in the North, it would give government and especially lending government some food for thought. Um, if there is an, uh, some, it would require an accounting and an, an audit that would really begin to shake up the system which has remained, yes, there is a little bit of debt cancellation or debt relief. By the way, I would never, and I hope to you all, I want to, I don't know if I can ask the Archbishop to be the one to charge you not to use the word debt for business because he has so many, I know it is forgiveness <coughs> is what forgiveness is, but in the context of debt, I think it has so many negative values associated with it that put the burden and responsibility on the borrowers and none of the creditors. And I think that we, we have, and part of what should be South we report for was the changing of the language. So we don't talk about creditors and debtors. We talk about borrowers, borrowers and lenders. Um, because it does begin to change the dynamic. So the question of reparation is one that we need to look at very seriously as campaigners. And um, because it's also one that does address and get to the heart of this matter of the creditor's responsibility. If you're going to be charged with paying reparations, it requires a serious examination of that relationship, that uh, transaction that happened. The third thing that I want to highlight is um, a process that uh, a number of northern campaigns, including the UK campaign and, and others were involved in a few years ago, um, we spent about 10 days in Italy, in Colovecchio, developing a document that was looking at the responsibilities of creditors and the res responsibilities of borrowers. Previously, a lot of the campaigning and the focus has, had been on um, the borrowers, the so-called debtors. So everything was said that they, what they were doing, what they had done wrong, and what they needed to do in order um, uh, to merit any kind of debt relief, any kind of debt cancellation. But this process that we were engaged in, we, uh, we called it um, a, a platform, a, the a sovereign debt restructuring uh, mechanism, sorry, not the sovereign debt restructuring me mechanism, but um, it was, I can't remember the title, it's just gone out of my head because I got another acronym. Uh, in there, uh, to know what happened. Uh, but it was, it was a document that was looking at how um, borrowing governments needed to behave and how lending governments needed to behave, saying that um, they were processes in both borrowing and lending countries that could hold governments accountable and should hold governments accountable. So that when the UK government is going to lend to the Kenyan government, there is a process that where, where civil society, let me use that term, civil society, 
at large in the UK and civil society at large in Kenya is looking at that process and saying yes to this and not to this, uh, looking at what are the considerations. Is it um, a loan that needs to be contracted? Is it really going to benefit uh, the, the, the country? Is it a loan to, as uh, Andrew was saying, uh, to facilitate the continuation of paying of all uh, debt? Or is it a loan that actually has merit and value uh, for, for the country? So we need to look at a relationship whereby instead of just, as we used to say, the finance ministers talking to each other, when they're borrowing or like borrowing and lending to each other on behalf of their country, um, which means that the only thing that is looked at is the financial part of it, not sometimes the environmental, the social, the, uh, the other economic aspects of it. So where do we have, how do we as campaigners come up with a process whereby the transparency, the transparency in the process, uh, the transparency in the trans transaction, and therefore the responsibility is held on both sides. So that if you make a bad loan, then you make a bad loan and there are consequences. If you take a bad loan, you take a bad loan and there are consequences. Not the current system where I make a bad loan and you have all the consequences and the responsibilities for it. What is that system that we can have that would begin to break, in a way, break this entrenched system that allows one side to um, be, um, what is the English word I'm looking for? Um, to bear no responsibility, to be free of responsibility, and then the other side to bear all the responsibility until the end of time, because some of these debts are so old and continue to be paid and continue to be serviced with no side in end. That is the nature of the system, and that for me is partly where we need to begin. How do we break the cycle? How do we break the system so that it is not a self-fulfilling cycle that uh, can never be broken and continue to be built upon?
but in the global north in, in the last decade, especially since uh, the financial crash, uh, we've seen governments, for one reason or another, for all sorts of reasons, are unable to provide the relief or have not been able to provide the relief. And so in response, it's perfectly justifiable. In fact, I think of it as a deed of democracy for people to take relief for themselves by any means necessary. And to do it according to reasons of justice, according to reasons of um, restoring the moral economy of, of a nation or restoring the moral economy of the household, if we're talking about household debts in particular. Uh, so it's very important to, to think about refusal and repudiation and debt resistance in terms of protect, a protective act of democracy, a way of salvaging popular democracy. So that's the kind of language I, I, I really do think we, we should be using. Um, so just to, to summarize again, uh, forgiveness is not empowering. Um, it's not a paradigm that empowers those who have been forgiven. In fact, you could argue that it introduces an extra layer of indebtedness. Someone's doing you a favor, right? And the expectation is you will um, you'll behave yourself and might return that favor. Uh, at some point in the future, in ways that are not entirely consonant with, with mutual aid. Mutual aid is more of an egalitarian type of uh, relationship. It's more, uh, it's more of a democratic, fundamentally democratic paradigm. And secondly, um, debt relief, even large-scale debt jubilees, um, and even if they're cyclical, it's very difficult to carry through a cycle and stop that, that spiral of asymmetry. I think you the way you described it. Um, they don't necessarily do anything uh, to um, to build alternative economies. They don't alter uh, the debt money system for the most part. They simply, you know, one off correct it to clean the slate. And then the cycle of accumulation starts all over again. Um, which is one of the reasons why they're, they're sort of popular to some degree with economic elites and economic managers. They like to talk about one-off uh, programs uh, of debt relief or forgiveness. So they don't alter the system. And so what we need to be doing uh, really is um, in parallel with or in tandem with engaging in acts of economic disobedience, which are, are as I say, justified as acts of democracy, what we need to be doing is building an alternative economy at the same time. One that is based on socially productive credit and not on predatory lending. Credit is not a bad thing. Um, everyone needs credit. We can't imagine an economy without credit. It should be socially productive credit, however. It is uh, ethical financing, principles financing, if you like. Um, and every, I'm sure many people in this room have their own ideas about um, how to build that alternative economy. Uh, there are already elements of it that, uh, that we engage in and participate in on a daily basis. Uh, if only you look around the landscape. Uh, there, there are non-capitalist enterprises and patterns of exchange that we engage in all the time that are not based on predatory lending. And in the aggregate, they amount to quite a considerable chunk of economic life. Um, so it's not a question of amounting a takeover of the state in order to bring into being an alternative economy. There are already elements of it in existence, and we need to, we need to start recognizing that. Uh, I would just end by saying that a lot of people who, who, who think and, and, and are very active on the landscape of alternative economies see the future as common space. And this is the general, I'm talking about the general, generational lifeblood of politically active young people, perhaps under the age of 40, for whom <coughs> common space and mutualist enterprises and initiatives are the way to go. Um, because of the history of neoliberalism, they're fundamentally distrustful of public action and of state action. And uh, perhaps some over the generational threshold, but to, to the degree to which I'm very sympathetic uh, towards common space initiatives, I do think there is also a place for public action and state action, and, there's, and there needs to be in this alternative economy that is not debt fueled, is not predatory debt fueled. We need the public and the commons to be more conversant with one another. 
And so I see the alternative economy that we need is a mixed economy, one in which the public and the common cooperate. Um, I don't see us transitioning to, for example, to a low carbon economy very quickly without public and state action. I don't think we can do that simply on a communist basis. Um, and we could, I could cite many other examples of why we need public and state action. Um, so I, I do hope that some of the, I'll, I'll stop in a minute, I do hope that um, <laughs> some, some of our discussion in the course of the day um, really deals with some of the, uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, building that alternative economy, which goes beyond and I think has to happen alongside our critique of the debt money system and our critique of the political burden of indebtedness. Because here again, I'm echoing the point that we're not just talking about the debt burden as an economic burden. It's also a political imposition on democracy that we need to, uh, that we need to escape from.
and seek long-awaited justices. Mercy, redemption, absolution, truth and reconciliation, relief, gratitude, freedom, compassion, connection, turning point, turning it inside out. This is the Book of Death, Volume 5, of a series of ten destroying countries. There is no debt without a story. This book asks for and accepts stories of all kinds and all scales, financial, social, emotional, political, historical, ecological, spiritual, existential. What is in your book of human accounts? What is in our book of human accounts? What would you have written off today or wish to draw attention to on any level that affects us all? Money, social injustice, time, love, attention withheld. It may be a debt that's a burden or a form of gratitude, a debt that will be repaid or should never be repaid, or a debt you share with others. We all owe or are owed something. Cover this page today with what you consider the most needs to be given voice or what you would like to momentarily free of, whether personal or third party. The book will be in the Brunei space here until the final plenary, and you can contribute online, burningthebook.co.uk, or via Twitter, at burningthebook, at any time. This book of debt will be open and readable online through April and May, journeying with me through Brighton and Hove, Resting its spine in between at the Fabrica Gallery in Brighton. Then, on Thursday, May 22nd, at 6.30, during the last week of the Brighton International Festival, it will be recited aloud and burned on the streets of the city. Let's surface the story, define the debt, and burn the book. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, guys, I'll be back shortly. I'll be staying here. Uh, it's about the uh, Eurozone preserving, uh, preserving the banks at what cost. Damn, it's not focusing properly. Apologies. By the way, back soon. See you later.